to uh, John's Gospel, the first chapter. Now we're going to talk about tonight the power of the spoken word. The power of the spoken word. It's important that we understand these things. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked and taketh away that which was sown in their hearts. Now, if you read Mark's account of it only, Mark said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, Satan comes immediately to take away that which was sown in the heart. Well, now, if, if that was the whole truth, then there wouldn't be much need of hearing it, would it? That Satan just going to steal it. That's why we should read all the Gospels. You see, one writer would catch something the other didn't catch, in, in places, Mark catches things that Matthew didn't catch. And uh, when you get the view from every side, you get the whole, the whole Word of God, you see. And uh, so Jesus came along, and, and Matthew recorded. I mean, Jesus, they were both hearing Jesus, but one of them heard it one way, and he wrote it down one way, and the other and remembered something else. He said, when anyone heareth the Word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not. Now, that's a key phrase, and sometimes that's a missing link. If people don't understand the Word, if they don't understand the Word of the kingdom, then not only will the wicked one talk you out of it, some well-meaning church members will talk you out of it. And, and you know, if you, if, if you get enough people saying, oh, well, brother so-and-so tried that, and then, you know, he died with an growing toenail or something about his dumb. Well, I learned a long time ago that, that you never take experience over the Word of God. It's always a dangerous thing. Uh, and, and quite often you will hear people say things like this. Well, now I know the Bible says that, but now here's what happened to me, or here's what happened to Brother So-and-so. Now, what are they doing? They're casting out the Word in, because of some experience either they had or someone else had. And you see, that gets people off the Word. So that's why Jesus said it the way he did, and Matthew caught it. If he understandeth it not, then somebody's going to talk him out of it. And it might be some well-meaning church member that just didn't understand the, the principles of the, of the Bible. Now, now, we talked about last night in the service, the fact that God, the way God taught Abraham faith was that he eventually had to change his name to get Abram, Abram, Abram to say, well, actually didn't, never did get Abram to say what God said. He changed his name to Abraham to get Abraham to say what God said in his word. The scripture said of Abram, he believed in the Lord. But the scripture says in the New Testament that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, how do you tell the difference in a person that believes in the Lord and one that believes what God said? Because they will say what God said and they will unashamedly pronounce what God said about them and proclaim it whether it is evident outwardly or not. It, it's called the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. You that were here last night, you remember we read in Romans, the fourth chapter, where it says, God who quickeneth the dead and calleth things that are not as though they were. Talking about how he taught Abraham faith. He called the thing that was not as though it was until it was. But he had to have Abraham's cooperation to cause it to come to pass. I'm convinced if he hadn't changed Abram's, Abram's name to Abraham, he'd have had to find him another man. But because God's word was out, he had to deal with the situation the way it was. Now, you, you'll realize that Abram did not go around saying, I'm not old, no, I'm not old, I'm not old, no, I'm not old, and my wife is not barren. No, he didn't do that. See, there's no power in denying what exists. 
Now, in the early 70s, when the Word of Faith was taught throughout this nation uh, as never before, sometimes people misunderstood because there was so much emphasis put on whosoever shall say and saying and saying and saying. There was so much emphasis put on that. But really, you can't put too much emphasis on that. They just simply uh, got hung up on that part of it because uh, if, if you study Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you know, it says, Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not his heart, believe what he's saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So it says, say three times in there and believe once. And like Brother Hagin says, you have to do three times as much teaching on the saying as you do believing. But yet people got the idea, well, all you have to do is say it. No, there's a lot more to it than saying it. But yet saying it is involved in causing it to work. But, but people got the idea, well, all you have to do is say it. You just say it a few times and it'll come to pass. Like one fellow told uh, Brother Happy Caldwell, he was out on the West Coast several years ago, and this fellow said, well, Brother Caldwell, this faith and confession stuff doesn't work. He said, well, oh, why do you say that? Well, he said, I said 300 times one day I had a new car, but I didn't get it. A whole day he said it. But didn't get it. See, all he had was the, the formula. He didn't have the principle. See, we, we talked about last night in the other service uh, about the law of faith. The law of faith is a law of God. I call it the law of change. And it's connected with words. The reason it's connected with words is because faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing, and hearing God's Word. The Apostle Paul talked about it in Romans, the 10th chapter. He talked about the righteousness which is of faith, says. He tells you what it would say. He said, the Word is nigh you, or as close to you, as getting, in your, getting it in your mouth and speaking it into your heart. And that's the way you transfer the Word of God from the pages of this book into your heart, into the, the, the core of your being where it'll work for you. And that's what Jesus talking about when He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. If the Word abides in you, you'll not be saying, well, I know the Bible says that, but now here's, here's what happened to me. No. You're going to say, the Word didn't change regardless of what happened to me. Because the Word works. The power of the spoken word is a tremendous thing in the scriptures. And uh, let's read from John here. I could spend all night introducing the subject, but let's get into it. St. John chapter 1, or Big, Big John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, you ought to underline that, all things were made by Him. Him who? Him, the Word. You see, in other writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, he, he talks about uh, he was the creator. Jesus, the Word, was the creator of all things. He was the creator. He was the Word personified. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, or prevailed not against it. You see, darkness never prevails over light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light, and all men through him might believe. He was not that light, was sent to bear witness of the light, that the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. Now notice, by him who? Jesus, the Word. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, no one received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, if you study these scriptures, you'll notice it refers to Jesus and the Word as one, and one with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. I get amused sometimes at the faith critics. They'll say things like, well, now these faith folks think that, that uh, the Word is God. Try to make the Word God. 
Why in the world we won't do that? It's already that way. Isn't that what it said here? The Word is God over every situation. God's Word is the final authority on any subject. Now, whether you believe it or don't believe it, it is still the final authority. And whether you act on it or don't act on it, it still is a workable system of the kingdom, and it is the law of change, the law of faith. I call it the law of change. If you're going to change something, you're going to change it this way. And I say, you change it this way. It, it comes through the Word of God. It comes by being obedient to what God said. But you can change situations and circumstances by the spoken Word of God. So now, now he comes on down to, to verse uh, 13. says, Which was born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the personification of God's Word. He came to this planet with a physical flesh, blood, and bone body to show you what God's Word could do in physical flesh form. Now, when we understand that He is one and synonymous with the Word of God, Let's go over to the uh, Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the of the deep, face of the deep. Now, the word without in verse 2 if you study it out, it is translated nearly always or most of the time. Made, uh, let's see, the earth was without form and void. The earth was not created void. It was made void. Now, that's, that's very obvious. Now, let me show you something, and I did, really didn't mean to get on to it, but we're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you come down here a little ways, and you, you find that God says that He called the dry land earth. Now, in verse 2, it's, it's uh, covered with water. He called the dry land earth. Up here in verse 1, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, there was a catastrophic event between verse 1 and verse 2 that made the earth void, without form, and covered with water. It wasn't Noah's flood. It was, we could call it Lucifer's flood. But see, God called the dry land earth. And if He created the earth, it was dry land. But here it's covered with water. Now, that'll help you understand the fact that the earth is probably could be millions of years old, but it had a facelift about 6,000 years ago. What you read here is the recreation formation of the earth because he said, uh, replenish the earth. I didn't really intend to get on to that, but that'll help you understand that science, true science and the Bible are not contrary to one another. But there's a lot of people that get the idea, well, the earth is only 6,000 years old. Well, there's other scriptures in, in the Old Testament that reveals it's much older than that. When, when Satan showed up in the Garden of Eden, he had already ruled over nations and had been cast out of heaven. He had to borrow the body of a serpent to manifest himself to Eve. But that's not the point I really came here to see. Here's what I came to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, he looked out and saw darkness, and he said, let there be light. You only get three verses into Genesis until you see God calling things that are not. You call for what's not there. Now, how did he do that? With words, the spoken word. God said... Now notice verse, verse 4. 
And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. Every time and every day you find God said, and God said, and God saw. Now, if God saw after he said, and we're created in the image of God, it tells you something. The way you can see yourself with the promise of God is by saying what the promise says. It creates an image. There's creative power in the spoken word of God. Now, notice here that uh, in verse 4 it says, And God saw. We come down in, uh, in the second day, and it tells you that God said, let there be a firmament, and so on, verse 6. And then you come down to, to verse uh, 10, says, God called the dry land earth, and together and together the waters called the sea, and God saw that it was good. God said, and God saw. 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 And if you'll say, you'll see. This is God's M.O. This is his method of operation. He released his faith in words. He used his words as containers to transport his faith out into the vast darkness, and he called light out of darkness. Now, somebody said, well, now, I can understand that, Brother Caps, because, you see, he's God. Well, maybe you can understand this, then. Come over here to verse 26. Let us, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl there, over the cattle, over, ever, uh, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let us make men in our image, our likeness. Let them have dominion. Now let me ask you, how are them going to have dominion? Same way that him had dominion. Now I know that's not good English, but it'll help you understand it. <laughs> Through the spoken word, now I'm talking about, that, that don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about speaking in line with God's word of promise. Let them have dominion. The Lord said to me one time, he said, son, he said, you've been, <laughs> I mean, he caught me boy, right where I was. <laughs> he said, you've been so spiritually illiterate, I couldn't talk to you intelligently. He said, you've been indoctrinated. And you know, T.L. Osborne said one time in a meeting, I'll never forget it. He said, when people get indoctrinated, they quit thinking. And you know that's true? They just accept what their doctrine says. They didn't set it out in the Word. And I had a lady write me uh, several years ago. I was on a radio station, went on a radio station in Memphis. I went on radio in 1977. And uh, this lady said, she wrote me a letter. She said, Brother Caps, I got so, you got me so stirred up one morning, I was going to work. And, and she said, that can't be right. I'm going home after work and get my Bible and prove him wrong. She said, my God, I found out they'd been lying to me for 40 years in my church. <laughs> well, they wasn't really lying. They'd been indoctrinated and they quit thinking. And they was blaming God for everything that happens. Well, it's God's will if it happens to you. No. <clears throat> now, here he says, God said... Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, how did he create? In his own image. Now, what did he do? And God blessed them. And he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl there, and so on. The Lord said to me, uh, when he was talking to me about it, he said, what you need to do, son, is, is forget everything religious you ever heard about this book, the Bible, and go back and read it like you never heard it before. And I just thought, well, I'm starting Genesis. And I got here to where it said I had dominion over the fish of the sea. I said, glory to God, I'll catch more fish now. I ne it never occurred to me that I had dominion over fish. My dad could catch five fish to my one, and in fact, sometimes he'd catch a lot more than that. 
And uh, I started saying, I have dominion. I wouldn't dare fish a lake without taking dominion over the fish. And uh, <clears throat> it changed, uh, and, and it works. <clears throat> I, got, I had the fish in the freezer to prove it. <laughs> I better not get started telling fish stories. Huh? <clears throat> But now here, when you get down to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning with the sixth day. God said and God saw. Every day God said, every day God saw. And somebody said, well, now I just can't see this healing business. Then you're not talking about it. You're not quoting healing scriptures. Because if, you, if the spoken word comes out of your mouth, it will get into your heart. The word is nigh you, Paul said. It's in your mouth and in your heart. First, it's in your mouth. Then it gets in your heart. Now, don't misunderstand you. You get some faith from hearing somebody else say what the word said. But it comes more quickly if you're speaking it out of your voice. So here we have a classic example in Genesis 1 that God has given man domin mankind dominion over this planet. But there's no authority exercise, there's no dominion exercise without words. The centurion came to Jesus in, in the eighth chapter of Matthew. He said, his servant lieth home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said, I'll come healing. Oh no, he said, you don't have to come to my house, just speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth, to another come, and he cometh to do this, and he doeth it. Here's a man that understood authority, and he understood that if Jesus said the word, his servant would be healed. He said, speak the word only, my servant will be healed. Here's a man that Jesus just stopped and preached a sermon. He said, this is the greatest faith I've ever found in all of Israel. Now, I asked the Lord one time, I said, why did this man have greater faith than all the covenant people? Now, he is a Roman centurion. <clears throat> this man did not even come under the covenant at that point. But Jesus said he had the greatest faith he'd ever seen. <clears throat> now, the reason speakers have to have water, it keeps the sermon from being dry. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> Somebody said, drink more. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus preached him a sermon. He said, this is the greatest faith I've ever found in all of Israel. And I asked the Lord, Lord, why did this man have greater faith? And he didn't even come out of the covenant at that point. The gospel was the Jew first, then to the Gentile. He said, the man tells you out of his own mouth. He said, I'm a man under authority. You have to be under authority to have authority. He said, speak the word. This man released his faith at my word. He was fully persuaded if Jesus spoke the word, he knew Jesus had authority over sickness and disease. If he speaks the word, it's settled. The man didn't try to believe. He wasn't believing he would believe. He had released his faith to that point. It was, he had used his faith to the limit. It was settled as far as he was concerned. He was fully persuaded, if Jesus speaks the word, my servant will be healed. Now just ask yourself, if Kenneth Copeland came to town or Oral Roberts or some uh, evangelist that you had great confidence in and, and you had somebody that was sick, would you say, oh no, we don't have to go pray for him, just speak the word. See, this man said, if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. As, as he is going to believe? No. He said, As you have believed. Past tense. He had already released his faith to a point of contact. And that point of contact was, If Jesus speaks the word, my servants healed. He was fully persuaded of that. And that's exactly what happened. His servant was healed the self same hour. Ten times, well, six times in Genesis, it says God said and God saw. Well, it says ten times that God said. And every day God said and God saw. And this is the point that we should never forget. If God said so he could see, 
If we ever going to see it in our spirit, if it's ever going to get on the inside of us, we're going to have to say it. Say what the Word says. Now, I'm not talking about saying things you have no Scripture for. Like someone said one time, they said, well, uh, would you, would you uh, uh, agree with me on this? And Well, what Scripture are you standing on? Well, nothing in particular. I said, well, that's what you're going to get, nothing in particular. <laughs> no, you've got, to have, you've got to have the Word for it. See, the power is in the Word. It's not just the saying it that causes it to happen. It has to have Word behind it. We're talking about the power of the spoken Word. Now, when you get over into uh, Hebrews, the, the uh, 11th chapter, we're all familiar with this, but, but let's look at it again. Because uh, so many times uh, it becomes old hat, so to speak, and we just kind of hold home. Well, we're going back to that verse again. Well, let's look at it. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things. One translation said, faith is giving substance to things hoped for. What is it we hope for? We hope for what God has given us in His Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, all the promises of God are yes and amen. God's already said yes to them before you ever ask Him. He's already given it to you. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, God hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. And how did He do it? Through the exceeding great and precious promises that by these exceeding great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Notice it didn't say you would be. It said you might be. Depends on whether you act on it or not. Whether you give voice to the promise of God or not, because that's where faith comes from. Remember Paul said in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. Faith in God comes by hearing the Word of God. The opposite end of that truth is faith in the devil comes by hearing the words of the devil. Now this is why it's so important to not go around talking what you think the devil said. Most of the time, it wasn't what the devil said anyway. It was, he may have influenced your, influenced your carnal mind, but most of the time it's your carnal mind rising up against some things. And the way to overcome that is get the Word of God in your mouth and renew your mind to the Word of God. Paul said in Romans, the, the 12th chapter, to not be conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not a measure, the measure. You ever, you ever stop to ask yourself, how do you measure faith? How would you go about measuring faith? Here's all the faith there is right here. That's all the Bible faith there is. What's this, this book? The way you'd measure how much faith you have is how much word do you have in you. That's the way you measure faith. Now, God has dealt to every man the full measure of faith. That's it right there. Now, how much of that word abides in you? That's how much faith you have. If none of this word abides in you, you don't have any faith. Sometimes people say, well, they didn't have enough faith. That was only the symptom. The problem was they didn't have the Word abiding in them. It's not enough to know what the Word said. You have to get that Word on the inside of you. You can know about the Word, rejoice about the Word, and just bomb out in every, every situation of life. You have to have that Word abiding in you. That means that you don't go around saying, well, I know the Bible says that, but now here's what happened to me. When you hear people say that, they've located themselves. They've cast out the Word because of some experience. Now, Jesus tells you about that in the parable of the sower. He said, if you sow among thorns, the thorns will spring up and choke it. If you sow on rocks, it'll spring up immediately. But it has no depth of earth and has no root. And when the sun's up, it's scorched and it withers away. So first thing you all do is, is gather up the thorns. <laughs> Pull the thorns up. And uh, being a farmer, I, I found out 
that if you sow on soil and the seed is very shallow, even rocky soil. In fact, not just a few weeks ago, I, I was planting some soybeans for a deer food plot. And, uh, and it, it was hilly and rocky, and, and I spilled some seed on rocks, just, just gravel, rocks. And uh, about a week later, I was there, and it rained a time or two, and, and, and man, in, in two days, those things were up and growing, right on top of that rock. But what happens when the sun gets up and gets hot? To no depth of root, and they die, wither away. See, no depth. So, so that's why we need to get the depth of the Word, get it on the inside of us. How do you do that? Word is nice in your mouth and it's in your heart. The more you say it, the more you believe it, the more you believe it, the more you'll say it. The more you say it, the more you'll believe it, the more you believe it, the more you'll say it. It's the confession of the Word that renews your mind and gets you to thinking like God thinks about it. Now you look at the Scripture, it says, Give and it shall be given unto you. And then you look at your finances and maybe you decided to give more. And probably what happens at first is something bad happens and it gets worse. That's what Jesus tells you in the parable of the source. That Satan comes to steal the word. That's his only hope is to get that word out of you before you get it to working. Because if you ever find out it works, they're never going to get the word out of you. But when, when the enemy hears somebody say, well, I know the Bible says that, but here's what happened to me. He knows he's got them. The word is now used in your mouth and in your heart. <clears throat> Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. It's not the evidence of things you can see. Through faith, verse 3, it says, through faith we understand the world were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. Now, that means that God did not make the world out of something that you could see. It was faith-filled words spoken that created the universe. God said, and God saw. God said, and God saw. He framed the world with His words with Jesus, the Word. Jesus was the personification of God's Word. Now, whether you realize it or not, you're framing your world daily with your words. Because what you say and continue to say is what you're going to believe and act on. It's your motivation. Because what you say gets in your heart. Man's heart directs his ways. As, uh, when you get the word in your heart, it, it motivates you in that direction. You always gravitate toward what you talk about the most. And if you're talking what the devil said or the bad things that's happened to you, this is why it's important that we don't talk the problems, talk the situations and circumstances that we're facing, because the more you talk it, the more you'll believe in it. And let's go a little further with that. If you pray the problem, your prayers will destroy your faith. I'm going to say that again, because some folks think that's blasphemous. You can destroy your faith by wrong praying. Lord, I've prayed, but it's not working out. Things are getting worse. Now, how did I know that? I prayed that prayer one time. <laughs> and the Lord, that's when the Lord said to me, <laughs> well, here's what he said. He said, what are you doing? It insulted me, you know. I, I thought he ought to know I'm praying. <laughs> I said, Lord, I'm praying. He said, no, you're complaining. And I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't come to me telling me what the devil said and calling it prayer. Boy, you talk about and that's when he said, you've been so spiritually ignorant, I couldn't talk to you intelligently, or so spiritually illiterate. And he said, you need, to, you need to see what my word said, say what my word said in the face of all contradictory evidence. 
Because, see, we're instigating the law of change. The law of faith is the law of change. If God said and God saw, if you'll say long enough, you'll see. Because you're created in the image of God, in His likeness. We are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. In uh, Romans, the first chapter, the Apostle Paul said, the invisible things of God from the creation of the world, now listen to this, are clearly seen, isn't that a paradox? The invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by things that are made. Well, what did God make? He made the earth, created the earth. He made man in his image and in his likeness. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, three in one. Man is a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body. Everything that is made reveals spiritual things in, a, in a one sense or another. That's just the way God works. Thermostat on that wall back there controls the heat and the cool of this building, but it can't do it unless it's hooked to the heart of the unit. That thermostat's a goal setter. You set it to 70 degrees, and when it's 40 degrees in here, you've created a problem for the heart of the unit, but it knows how to fix it won't cook your food, it won't wash your clothes. Wasn't designed to do that. But if you set that thermostat on 70 and leave it there, it will send an impulse out there to the heart of that unit and said, get us some, some uh, warm air in here, we're cold. That unit can't say, no, nah, we think you need the, uh, the, the air conditioning, we're gonna crank up. No, it can't do that. Because what you dial in that gold setter controls that. Your head, your mouth is the goal setter. What you're saying sends an impulse down here to the heart of the unit and says, find a way to cause that to come to pass. And while you're asleep, day and night, day or night, whether you're sleeping in the day or night or whether you're doing whatever, the human spirit is searching the avenues of God's wisdom, find a way to cause to come to pass what you're saying. Now, God is not going to cause something to happen that's detrimental to you, but your words can cause it to come to pass. Good, bad, or indifferent. Now, we said this in some of the other service, bear out here fits good because being a farmer for 30 years or 29 years before I went into the ministry, I found out that the seed has dominion over the soil. Soil never has dominion over the seed. The seed you plant the soil has no choice but to produce it. Now, the parable of the sower, Jesus refers to the heart of man as soil. That tells you something. This is God's M.O. The seed that's planted determines what will be raised, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Somebody slipped up. See, I have a Christian farm. I dedicated to the Lord. I, when I was uh, farming, I used to spray my... Uh, uh, cotton with Malachi 311. <laughs> My cotton will not uh, cast its fruit before the season on the ground, you know. I'd confess the word over it. But you see, what if somebody went out on my farm at night in the backside and, and planted marijuana out there? Now, it's a good Christian farm. You reckon they say, no, we're not raising marijuana. We're a good Christian farm. It has no choice. It has no choice of the matter. The seed has dominion over the soil. Whether you say in what is right or whether you say in what is wrong, you're planting seeds. God framed the world with His words. You're framing your world with your words daily. And I know there's people that think, no, oh, he's, just, he's just extreme. Yes, I'm extremely cautious about the words I speak because I've learned the power of words. And if you, will, if you will follow Jesus' teaching on this, it'll change your life forever. So here he says, he framed the world with his words. Now, now this, this verse 1 says, through faith we understand, uh, I mean, now faith is a substance of things hoped for. The word substance there 
Go to Hebrews 1. In Hebrews 1, we find Let's read the first three verses. God, who in sundry times, divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now notice, he made the worlds, how? Through his Son. Who's his Son? The Word, Jesus. Jesus and the Word are one. You'll notice the Apostle Paul in one or two occasions says the faith of Jesus Christ. Why do you call the faith of Jesus Christ? Because Jesus is the Word, and that's where faith comes from. It's from the Word. It's resident in the Word. It's resident in this Word, but it won't work in this book form. It has to get on the inside of you. That's why I said it's in your mouth and in your heart. The power of the spoken Word to bring things into being. Now he says, who being the brightness of his glory, now listen to this very closely, talking about Jesus, being the brightness of God's glory and express image of his person, express image of his person. What is an expressed image? How would you express an image you have inside you with words? That's the way you express images, with words. Words create images. Jesus was the, is the express image of God's substance. The word person here is the same Greek word translated substance in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Very same word. So Jesus is the exact expression of God's substance. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This is where we get our faith roots. They're one. God and the Word are one. Jesus was the Word of God. Now, He was separated when He came to the earth. He took on a human form. He didn't come here as God. He came here as the Son of God, operated as a human being, why didn't he heal the sick before he was 30 years of age? Because he couldn't. He's operating as a man. The Apostle Paul calls him the man, Jesus Christ. When he was baptized in the River Jordan at age 30, he had never healed a single person, never cast out one demon. Why? Because he couldn't. He was operating as a man. Why did he have to be born as a man with a physical flesh, blood, and bone body on this planet to have authority here? Only people that are born here have authority on this planet. In John 10, it says, He that entereth by the door, and the sheep entereth not by the door, and the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The door into the sheepfold, which is the earth, is to be born here. That's the legal entry into the earth. Satan wasn't born here. He's a created being. He's an illegal alien to this planet. He has no authority on this planet, only what he can usurp from some body. He didn't even have a body when he showed up in the Garden of Eden. He had to usurp the authority of a serpent and get his body to manifest himself. You're the one that has the body. It gives you authority on this planet. You don't know anything else to do. The devil comes around your house stirring up trouble. Get your birth certificate out and read it to him. <laughs> Born January 4, 1934, in Brummett, Arkansas. Now, where's yours? He doesn't have one. And when he finds out you know you have authority and he doesn't have any, he'll leave your house, gather up his belongings, and go down to somebody else's house. <clears throat> The express image of his person. You express an image with words. <clears throat> Jesus was the Word of God personified. So faith is the personification of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Now, in a court of law, if you have evidence, it has to exist if you have evidence. 
So in the realm of the Spirit, whatever you can believe based on the authority of the Word of God exists in the realm of the Spirit, or you could not have evidence for it. You have a title to your car. If somebody steals your car, steal your car, you're the legal owner of that car. It's no less your car than it was when it's sitting in your driveway. You just don't have possession of it. But when they find it, it comes back to you because you have the title deed. Faith is the title deed. If you can find it in the Word of God, confess it until faith fills your heart, you can have what the Word promised. But now here's, here's where the problem comes in. So many times people say, well, now, if it happened to brother so-and-so, if God did it for him, he'll do it for me. Well, now, wait a minute. Do you know what brother so-and-so know, knew? Did you do what brother so-and-so did? Did you have the word in your heart like brother so-and-so did? All that enters into the equation. See, you may know about the word, but you may not have it in you. It does not abide in you. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that people haven't understood. For instance, Jesus said in Matthew 12 that a good man out of the good deposit of his heart, he brings forth good things. Evil man out of the evil treasure or deposit of his heart, he brings forth evil things. For, now listen, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now this tells you that it doesn't come by just saying it it has to be abundantly in the heart to bring it forth. And whatever's abundantly in your heart will always get in your mouth. So check up on what you have abundantly in your heart. Many years ago, I was farming. and had a fellow working for me for a few days. And, and we're driving down the turn road. He was in a in pickup, and he was in a big way of telling me some big story. And he brought out a big curse word. And, and he happened to realize that I was a minister. He threw his hand over his mouth. Oh, he said, I, excuse me, I don't talk that way. <laughs> what is in his heart got in his mouth. See? See, what is in your heart in abundance. Now, so many times people start confessing the Word. They confess it a few days and then they give up because nothing happened. The first stage of confessing the Word of God is doing very little to change the situation. First thing it'll do is renew your mind to the Word of God. It will cause faith to come, but it has to be in your heart in abundance before you can speak words that change things. Now, the first thing your words are doing is changing you and renewing your mind. Renews your mind, gets you to thinking like God thinks. And I challenge you to just write down the scriptures that uh, would produce the faith that you, whatever you're believing for. Confess it daily aloud. I mean, uh, get by yourself and just speak it out loud daily over and over and over and over. Thank God for it. It'll get on the inside of you. And before long, you'll have the feeling, hey, it's mine. It's mine. And that's really what Mark eleven twenty three 23 said. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, believe what he's saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. The Greek says it different than that. It says, believe that he has received, past tense, when he prayed, well, when he prayed or said, either way, believe the original Greek says, you've got it. You've laid hold on it. You've got 